Well, good morning, New Spirit family. What a privilege and a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, praise team, thank you so much. Uh, what an amazing worship service, amen? amen. Uh, they, just, they just bring us to the throne of grace every Sunday. And uh, I'm just thankful to the Lord. And as you're going to see, I did call Jackie last night and shared with her. I said, you know, I, I see your music, I see your songs, and it speaks to the message today. And I hope it speaks to you today. And I was uh, praising and in prayer, and I realized that this may well be, and probably will be, the last time I preach in this location. My family and I will be out next week, and I want to thank Brother Rudy. He's agreed to bring the message next week. And the uh, manager of the new location called me yesterday to let me know that all of the carpet has been installed, the ceilings are installed, the lights are on. Uh, all fresh coat of paint, and uh, he believes that uh, this coming week will be the completion day. So keep that in, in prayer. Uh, I'm excited about that, and if this is indeed uh, my last time, I pray the Lord uh, leave a good resounding message in these, in these walls. And my prayer is, and has been, that the group that follows here, my petition to the Lord has been, let it be another another group of believers that would take this place. And so I've actually reached out to the uh, local uh, San Antonio Baptist Association and other folks to let them know that this location is available. Please find another church looking for a place so that, they, that these walls can continue to hear the, the worship and the service of the Lord. So let's continue to pray for that as well. Amen. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn to the book of Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9, and if you will please... Uh, stand in honor of God's word, Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. I usually read out of the ESV, but I am reading out of the NASB this morning. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. <clears throat> and the word of the Lord says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, Rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. Lord Heavenly Father, I thank you for the privilege to be here. I thank you for this church I thank you for this family. I thank you for giving me a home, a place where I can come and be loved and love others and to know that I'm safe, that I'm in your presence, and that I can joyfully worship with you alongside my brothers and sisters. And I pray, Lord Father, that, Lord, I know you know every heart here, and I know you know every need here. And, Lord Father, I know that you have a message for every person here today. Holy Spirit, I pray, Lord. I want to be, get me out of the way. Lord, use me only as an instrument, but I, I want every word to be yours. And say what you need to say to your people, because I know you love us, and you have a message of hope for us. And Lord, let this message, Lord, be heard with receiving ears, and to be received with a receptive heart. I thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to share with you the story of Nick Sitzman. Years ago, Reader's Digest featured the story of a man named Nick Sitzman. And Nick was a strong, healthy, young man, and he worked as a railroad yard man. That was his job. And one day, while he was checking on the railroad cars at the end of the day on the yard, he accidentally locked himself in a refrigerated boxcar. 
And knowing that he was the last guy there on the yard and that all the workers had left for the day and they wouldn't return until the next morning, Nick panicked. He knew that the temperature in those refrigerated boxcars usually could get down to as low as zero degrees, below freezing. And so he immediately tried to pry the door open and he, and he banged and he did everything that he could. He yelled out, but it did no good. And already, already feeling the effects of the cold inside that refrigerated boxcar, he found a, a knife uh, and something to etch with, and he began to etch words into the wooden floor because his fear and his worry told him this may be his last moments on earth. And he started etching on the ground, trapped inside. It's so cold. These may be my last words. Body getting numb. And the final words, this is the end. And the next morning, when the crew showed up, they slid open the door and they found Nick there dead. And the autopsy report revealed that every physical sign of his body indicated that he indeed froze to death, just as Nick feared. But the problem, the problem and what Nick didn't know was that the refrigeration unit on that boxcar was not operating. It was inoperative. In fact, when they measured, the temperature inside was only 55 degrees. Well within human survival range. You see, Nick had killed himself by the power of his own thoughts. It was amazing. Uh, they began to examine it and research it. And his friends, when they interviewed him, they said that he was a hard worker and he was a good friend but that he worried all the time, that he was consumed by his fear. He was consumed by worry. He was constantly worried about things, and this eventually killed him, literally. His own fear, his own anxiety, his own worry convinced him that he was freezing to death. And this was researched and found that, indeed, the power of the mind has the power to even kill you, if you will believe it. And so it goes, I think that the British philosopher James Allen said it well. He said, you are today where your thoughts have brought you. And you will be tomorrow where your thoughts will take you. And today I want to talk to you about the power of worship over worry. I think that we are the sum of our thoughts and actions. We're the sum of our thoughts and actions and if we really pay attention to what God is saying to us here through the words of Paul, the decision to choose worship over worry can indeed be the difference between life and death. And when we look at this section here in Philippians chapter 4, what we just read, it's known as the exhortation. And the exhortation was a common part of ancient letters. And Paul, of course, knew how to read letters. And we have to remember that these epistles... Colossians, Philippians, Galatians, Romans, these were letters what, uh, that Paul wrote to the churches. And really what we're doing is we're reading somebody's mail. We're reading Paul's mail to these churches' messages. And they usually came in the original or the, the standard structure. It would have a salutation, an introduction. And then it would have the content, the, the material, the, the stuff that Paul wanted to talk to the church about. Answering questions, resolving problems or issues. And then before the concluding prayer, he would write this exhortation. And the exhortation was where he would challenge and encourage his readers with the wisdom that he just shared. In other, in other words, he would say, as a result of what I just shared with you, as a result of the issues that we just addressed, I want to exhort you to do the following things. It was a call to action as a result of the message that he gave. And in the same way today, I want to exhort you. I want to exhort you because as we close out this year, can you believe that we're looking at 2022 here very soon? To me, it seems like the year has just gone by so quickly. And as we close this year and we prepare for this new coming year, and really a lot of changes are coming, I want you to examine your life and I want you to be willing to make some life-changing decisions, serious life-changing decisions, and especially about the worry in your life. And I want you to notice here that Paul gives three 
exhortations. And these exhortations are imperatives. They're, they're, they're commands. They're instructions. And he does it in three verses. Verses 4, 5, and 6. Notice that the first one is rejoice in the Lord. That's verse 4. The second instruction he gives, the second exhortation is be gentle or let your gentleness be seen. That's verse 5. And for the ESV readers, you might see reasonableness. But I think I prefer the NIV and especially the NASB, your gentle spirit. I think that's more the rendering here. And then the third uh, exhortation he gives is found in verse 6. Stop worrying. Stop being consumed about your anxiety. And Paul offers an alternative. Rather than to be consumed by worry, rather than to be consumed by anxiety, by prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving, present your request to God. Those are the three exhortations. Now, on the surface, these three may seem random. It may seem that these instructions are random as if Paul is saying, okay, I've said what I want to say. Now, let me just give some, some exhortations, some, something to, to encourage you. So, uh, I don't know, uh, rejoice in the Lord, uh, be gentle, and stop worrying. That sounds good. That's furthest from the truth. The truth is, is Paul was pointed and very, very effective in the words that he chose. He's very, very effective in what he's saying here. Because the truth is, is that Philippi was facing very real and very present dangers in their lives. And in each one of these exhortations, Paul is offering the proper response to each one of those challenges. And what is that response? Worship. Worship. In every one of these challenges, Paul is telling them, I want you to worship, and not just worship, but choosing worship over worry. And the reason I say that Paul challenged the Philippians to worship is because all three of these exhortations are elements of worship. I think that we need to rethink our notion of what worship is. I want this congregation to be learned about what it means to worship. If I were to ask you, what is worship? Or if you were to talk to someone and you would say, I want to invite you to come worship with us, and they would ask you, well, what is worship? Could you answer that? Could you tell somebody, what is worship? Because I think that really, in many ways, many Christians don't understand what worship is. Listen, I think it's great that we come and we gather together. That certainly is an element of worship when we fellowship. I think that sitting down and, and hearing the Bible studies in the morning, I think that's an element of worship when we study God's word. And it certainly is worship when we gather together and we stand and we praise and we sing and we lift up our voices. That was worship, what we experienced. And praise the Lord, I think that when we sit down and we hear the, the pastor preach a message and we receive the message, I think that's worship. But that's not all that worship is. Worship is way more than that. I think that the fundamental definition of worship is obedience to God. If God instructs you, if God guides you, if God speaks to you and you respond in obedience, you're worshiping the Lord. That's worship. I think that that's the most important thing to understand. Go with me to Micah chapter 6 verses 6 through 8. Micah chapter 6 verses 6 through 8. How shall we define worship? Listen what the, to what the Lord says to the prophet Micah. With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams, in 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. That is worship. Irby, are you saying that if God speaks to me and he tells me to go in a certain way and I respond, that that is an act of worship? Yes. To respond in obedience is worship. And I think that in the same way, Paul exhorted the Philippians to choose worship over worry in these three challenges that they faced to be obedient to God. And I want to look at each one of these three because I think it speaks to us today. 
Go back with me now to Philippians. <clears throat> I want you to look. Now, let's take a look. Let's take a, micro, a microscope here and look at each one of these verses in detail. Verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. The first challenge that the Philippians faced was danger. And this is why Paul told them, rejoice in the Lord always. I again will say rejoice. He was speaking to the danger that they faced. And this danger was both internal and external. We can read Philippians chapter 1 verse 28. In chapter 3, verses 2 and 18, we'll find out quickly that there were two dangers that they faced. Externally, the Romans were persecuting them for their faith. Wherever they went, they faced persecution. These, these um, uh, Christians, they're crazy. What's wrong with them? They don't worship and honor the emperor. They don't do what we do. They don't worship the gods like the way we do. They don't participate in our festivals. And so they were persecuted for their faith. This was the external danger. And internally, there were false teachers. All we got to do is read, again, chapter 3, and we'll read about the Jewish fundamentalists that were insisting on Torah observance. You guys aren't doing it right. You have to be circumcised. You have to follow the Jewish law. You have to do everything according to Torah if you want to be a good Christian. And Paul is saying, don't listen to them. And what is Paul's recommendation in the face of all of this danger? Rejoice. That's what he says to them. And this rejoicing, it's not just an appeal to, to, to joy as an encouragement. He's not just trying to encourage them. This is an appeal to faith. I want you to notice, it's not just a rejoicing, but a rejoicing in the Lord. It's rooted, it's based in the Lord. And not just in the Lord, but always. Never a circumstance when we don't rejoice. Never a situation when we don't give thanks. And we, we heard about that this morning in, in Bible study. Paul exhorts them, don't let them steal your joy. Yes, they're persecuting you. Yes, they're attacking you. Yes, you're facing all of these trials, but don't let them steal your joy. That is yours. And when you give in to them, then they take the one thing that God wants to bless you with, your joy. So what do you do in the face of trial? What do you do in the face of all this tribulation? What do you do when people are unjust to you? Rejoice. I want you to understand that Paul is explaining to them that they have no control over their circumstances. The next time you begin to worry, the next time that you're stressed over a situation in your life, I want you to do what one time my wife asked me to do. She said, you know what? Write down all the things that are stressing you out. And I wrote them down. She says, okay, now push away the things that, that you have no control over. Well, I can't control that. I can't control that. And what I found myself is staring at an empty table. And I realized I have no control over any of that. And Paul is saying to them, folks, you can't control how people treat you. You can't control the cir circumstances of these, of, of these dangers. But what you can control is your attitude. What you can control is the way you walk and experience your life. But if your joy, listen to this, if your joy is not rooted in the Lord, then it will not succeed. It must be rooted in the Lord. And if it's done that way, then regardless of your outside circumstances, regardless of what happens, you will rejoice always. And when we do this, we're worshiping. This is worship. We're not supposed to rejoice just when things are good. Anybody can do that. Anybody can give thanks when everything's great. The pagans do that. The world does that. The secular-minded person can do that. But when we worship the Lord, when we rejoice in the midst of our sufferings, that's when we truly worship. That's when God can smile on us. That's when God can truly bless us. I think it's important that we understand the significance of what Paul is saying to them here. And notice how Paul repeats the imperative in verse 4. Notice how he says it. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'm going to say it again, rejoice. And I think that there's a couple of reasons why he does this. And the first one, I think it's because he's being emphatic. He's emphasizing this. He wants them to understand, yes, I mean what I said. Yes, I mean it. Yes, I said it. No conditions, no exceptions, rejoice in everything, always. 
Never an excuse not to rejoice. And if our joy is not based on the Lord, we will easily lose it. You know, in my, my ministry, I have met countless people, sadly, that have come to church and they get involved and they're signing up for things and they're serving in the ministries and everything. And then after a while, they fall away. And many times I've gone and I've sought them out. Hey, we miss you. We haven't seen you in a few months. What happened? And I've had more than one person tell me, you know, Irby, I came and things were good. But then, man, I just lost my joy. It just wasn't fun anymore. I just didn't enjoy it anymore. I got busy with all the stuff and it became a burden. They started signing me up for these other things and it just wasn't fun. Well, what happened? I knew. I knew that what happened was there was no joy based in the Lord. And sometimes it's not the person's fault. Sometimes it's the church's fault. Sometimes it's the people guiding the people that don't teach them the joy in the Lord. I think that when two people love each other, they're going to always be happy regardless of their circumstances. Yeah. I would rather be poor and broken but with my family than to be rich and famous but alone. I want to be with my family. And I've got chores to do. My wife has got chores to do. And we get home and we have to clean and we have to do this and we have to pick up and whatever. But I joyfully do it because I want to share my life with her. And it's the same way with Christ. If your joy is really in God and not in the social affairs, not in the events, not in all the other stuff, but really rooted in Christ, then you will never lose your joy because you don't want to be anywhere else. And that's what Paul is telling them. Rejoice. And yes, I'm going to repeat it. Rejoice. He's being emphatic here. But let me tell you another reason why I think that Paul is repeating this exhortation. And I think it's a more powerful one. Because I think that Paul probably knew that when the Philippians read what he told them to do in the face of all of their circumstances, that he would say to them, rejoice, that they would say, what? Wait, hold on a second. Paul, you know our circumstances. You know what they're doing to us. And your only advice is to rejoice. And Paul says, yes, I'll say it again. Yes, I said it. Rejoice. That's why he repeats it. And I want you to understand something about this. <clears throat> Do you know where Paul was when he wrote this letter? He wasn't in the comfort of his own home. He wasn't in some, in some hacienda somewhere sipping on a drink and relaxing. He wasn't with friends and family. He was in Rome in a prison. This was written about 62 A.D., about two years before he's beheaded by Nero. He's awaiting trial. Whenever he says rejoice in the face of danger, it's not just danger, but death. So here comes a man who says, rejoice. He's got chains on his, on his feet. He's locked up. Rejoice. And the people say, Paul, you know what we're going through. And we know what you're going through. You know what, what's happening to us, and we know what's happening to you. And you're saying rejoice, and he says yes, and I'll say it again. Rejoice. I cannot imagine a man with more strength based on his faith than Paul in this kind of circumstance. It's amazing. Because it tells me that in the face of our problems, when we really look at what's happening, if we find our joy in Christ, there's nothing that can happen to us. To me, it's so important to understand when we face danger and, and the enemy attacks us, the greatest thing that we can do is rejoice. And that, my friends, is worship. The second thing that we read is found in verse 5. Look at this again. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. The second challenge that the Philippians faced, that the first one was danger, the second one was division. I want you to notice verses 1 through 3 of chapter 4. The first three verses before we read verse 4. Notice what he says to them, chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. He says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see my joy and crown in this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. And then verse 2. I urge Euodia and I urge Sintiq to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement, also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. These two women weren't getting along. Good thing that that doesn't happen anymore, right? <laughs> the attacks, 
the threats and the persecutions, they were taking a toll on the church. There was a lot of stress on this church, and now there was division because they started to take it out on each other. How often we unleash our stress on the wrong people. How often we let our circumstances get the better of us, and we often mistreat and take it out on the wrong people. And Paul exhorts them. Verse 5, notice what he says. Let your gentle spirit, your gentleness, be known to all people. The Lord is near. Notice that Paul asked them to let their gentleness be seen by all people, not just their friends, not just the people at church, but by all people. Because it's in those circumstances that we can shine the light of Christ, that we can be a display, a witness, a testimony for Jesus. And so Paul is saying, no matter how other people treat you, no matter how unfair, never cease to let your gentleness be seen. And this Greek term here is more than just gentleness. Gentleness doesn't, doesn't really capture this word here, but it's a spirit that does not persist in justice. In other words, the Greeks had a word for it. They said this word, it wasn't just justice, but it was something better than justice. It's a person who doesn't feel entitled. It's a person who doesn't demand their own rights and entitlements because a gentle person doesn't insist on their rights and privileges. They choose courtesy and respect over their personal rights and privileges. And they would rather forego, even though they have a right to it, even though somebody has done them wrong, they'll say, I'm going to forego that in the spirit of peace and harmony. Now that, my friends, is the spirit of Christ because that's what Jesus did for us. Amen. Compare this with the world. Compare this with the woke culture. Compare this with cancel culture. Compare this with this offensiveness culture today where everybody insists on their own personal rights. I have a right. It's my privileges. It's my rights. And Paul is saying, not for the Christian. For the Christian, we have a different, different thought. It's not about me first. Because the true gentle person doesn't complain. You don't hear them say, it's not fair. This type of gentle, gentleness considers others above themselves. That's a gentleness that this world doesn't know. And I want you to notice an oft-overlooked statement here. The Lord is near. What a strange statement. I want you to let your gentleness be seen. The Lord is near. Well, Paul, what does that have to do with anything? It has everything to do with this. Because Paul is asking them, if you really believe that the Lord is near, if you really believe that the day of the Lord is at hand, then why do you persist in your petty little rivalries? How big of an issue is this in the light of eternity? He says, keep things in, in perspective. If the Lord is near, if the Lord is at hand, if you really believe this, then you wouldn't insist on such a petty, trivial stuff as you do. When we're gentle with others, when people even mistreat us, and when they're unfair to us, when we show grace and mercy and forgiveness, what we're doing is, we're choosing worship over worry. Because when people do us wrong and we dwell on it, it does nothing but eat you alive. And the third thing I want you to see is found in verses 6 through 7. Listen to the third exhortation now. The third instruction, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The third challenge that the Philippians faced was distress. They faced danger, they faced division, and now they face distress. All we have to do is read Philippians chapter 1, verses 18 to 19, and we find out that the Philippians were worried about Paul. They heard that he was in prison. They heard about Nero. They knew what Nero was doing. They knew the Christians were being burned alive. They knew that they were being thrown into the arena and torn apart by wild animals. They were worried for their pastor, for their leader, for the person who had started this church and had encouraged them all these years. But they also feared for their own future. What's going to happen to Paul? What's going to happen to him? He's in prison. And just as important, what's going to happen to us? So they faced distress because there was an uncertainty about their future. I want you to notice 
Now, verses 10 to 14 of chapter 40. We read what was happening before, and now we're going to read what happened after. Notice what Paul says to them concerning his situation in Rome and his imprisonment. Notice what he says. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. How often people have, have uh, not interpreted Philippians 4, 13 in the correct way. Paul is saying, no, I've learned to do all things, not as, as, in, as in some, some superpower that some person can have. <coughs> I've learned to trust in the Lord in the midst of my affliction. Yes, I'm facing death, but I've learned to be happy. I've learned to be content in the midst of it. So Paul's third exhortation in this case is the only command that is negative in form. Notice what he says again in verse, 16, uh, in verse 6, be anxious for nothing. In other words, in this case, he's telling them not to do something in this third case. Don't do this. And what is that thing not to do? Don't worry. Stop worrying for me. I've learned to be okay, to be content. I'm content. You need to stop worrying. And Paul teaches them what to do. What do you, let me tell you what to do with that fear. Let me tell you what to do with that uncertainty, Philippians. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Paul, why do you repeat prayer and supplication? Isn't that the same thing? By prayer and supplication, or maybe for some of you, petition. Isn't that the same thing? Are you just being redundant here, Paul? No. Prayer here is prosuke. And prosuke refers to the prayers a person offers to God. This is between me and God. I'm going to offer a prayer. That's, that's prayer, prosuke. But supplication or petition for some of you, it's the aces. And the aces refers to the petitions and prayers between two people. So it's a petition made between others, between human and God, and between human and human. So here Paul is teaching the Philippians not to pray with selfish hearts. So in everything, don't just go to the Lord and just tell him everything you want. Let's talk about me. It's about me, me, me. Instead, I want you to know the heart and the prayer and the needs of your fellow man. And bring your supplication, bring your petitions, bring their needs as well. I don't want you just to concern yourself for you, but concern yourself for others. He's teaching them not to be selfish here. In other words, it's an exhortation to pray with a gentle heart. Let your gentleness be seen. Let it be seen in your prayer. I want you to notice also, we are to pray with thanksgiving. And we just finished thanksgiving. Let me tell you what's so important about this. Pray with thanksgiving as we make our requests made known to God. Here, Paul is guarding the Philippians against an ungrateful soul. He's guarding them. Do not become ungrateful. Because people who pray without gratitude, they're looking only at what they don't have. I'll repeat that again. When we pray only for the things that we don't have, and we don't pray with thanksgiving, we don't acknowledge the things that we do have, we're going to be ungrateful. And that is not worship. Let me tell you something. The quickest way to get distressed, the quickest way to get frustrated, the quickest way to lose your joy is to meditate on what you don't have. Just spend time thinking about the things you don't have and you're going to lose your joy. Think about the things that you want and you're going to get frustrated. When you dwell on the wrongs that people have done to you, you're going to get angry. When you think about all the injustices that you face, you're going to get angry pretty quick. When you focus on the faults of others, especially the loved ones and the people near to you, when all you do is look at the things that they can't do, you're going to become unhappy really quick. But when you pray with thanksgiving, when you first look at what you do have, when you first look at the things that God has given you, you're going to pray in a whole different light. You're going to have a prayer 
with a different attitude. To pray with thanksgiving. That's prayer with an attitude of gratitude. That's what that is. And friends, not all prayer is worship. Not everything. Just because you're, you're praying doesn't mean that you're worshiping the Lord. Because if you pray in selfishness, if you pray in, in hate, if you pray in anger, you're not praying in the correct way. Here Paul is saying, no, you pray in thanksgiving. Only when we pray in thanksgiving, only when we give thanks, that we acknowledge everything that God has given us, that we truly worship God. Because when, then we know the difference between need and want. And we have to learn that, my friends. Because that's the only way it's going to shift our focus. He's saying, you're only going to become grateful when you pray with thanksgiving. As the old adage goes, I was sad that I had no shoes until I met a man with no feet. Verse 7. Notice verse 7 again. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He reminds us, if we pray this way, our reward will be a peace that surpasses all comprehension or understanding. It's a joy and a peace that the world cannot understand. It will make no sense to them. How in the world are you joyful in the midst of your circumstances? Because my joy is not based on my circumstances. How are you happy and rejoicing after everything they've done to you? Because my joy is not based on what others do to me. How can you rejoice in the midst of everything you're going through? Because my joy is based on something other than those things. That's why it surpasses all comprehension. It's a joy and peace that the world cannot know. Have you ever met a prayerful person? A person who's filled with prayer? You're going to see a peaceful person. I've never met a person who prays at all times and doesn't have peace. They've learned the art of peace through prayer. And Paul uses a military, a military metaphor here to describe God's peace. He's saying that God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And the literal meaning is he's going to keep guard over your hearts and minds. God's going to protect you. He's going to protect you from the evil one. He's going to protect your heart and he's going to protect your mind because you know that's where the enemy attacks. And if you pray this way, you're not on your own to defend yourself against the enemy. God will keep watch. He's going to guard, watch over, keep guard your hearts and your minds. Did you know that Philippi was a, a Roman garrison town? Did you know that it was a home to one of the strongest <laughs> Roman military headquarters in the empire? Did you know that? Had a fortified base with many equipped soldiers. So when Paul tells them, that God would keep guard over their hearts and minds, it would have registered a special meaning to them. They would say, we understand, because they were seen it visibly every day. So let me ask you, how is your prayer life? How is your prayer life? When's the last time you really, really had a good conversation with God? How often do you pray? What circumstances will bring you to your knees in prayer? What has to happen for you to humble yourself in prayer? Do you wait until the last minute, until you've exhausted all hope? Or is it the first thing, the first weapon you reach for when you find yourself in those difficult circumstances? How's your prayer life? If I'm really going to exhort you today, and as we look to the future and especially to the new year, I want to encourage you to examine your prayer life because prayer is worship and it's the greatest weapon against fear and worry. That's why Paul tells us that we should pray in everything. And let's take a look at verses 8 through 9. I'm not going to exegete verses 8 through 9. You know how hard it was for, not, for me not to exegete 8 and 9, to not sit here and give you all the breakdown? But the Lord put it in my heart, no, I don't want you to exegete. I want, them, I want the, the verses to speak for themselves. So I'm not going to break everything down for you. But notice what it says. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. The only thing I want to note is that Paul writes a beautiful, majestic rhetorical phrase here and he uses a six-fold repetition and the word is whatever. In Greek, it's hosa. And I want you to notice, six times Paul lists the noble and godly things in the Christian life. Notice, 
Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute. The six things that one could say, these are the noble things that the Christian should look for. And then he adds two conditional phrases. Notice again, the second part of uh, verse 8. If there is any excellence, and if anything worthy of praise. And then he says to them, concludes, dwell on these things. Let me tell you how I interpret this. Six times, Paul is intentionally vague. Notice that. Whatever is true. Whatever, Paul? Whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely and of good repute, he doesn't specify. He doesn't point his readers to where they can find it. He doesn't say, you'll find it here. He says, whatever is. And he does the same thing with the two conditional phrases. If there is any excellence and if anything is worthy of praise. And again, Paul is intentionally vague. He doesn't confirm to his readers that these things are going to be found exactly here. He doesn't tell them where. He doesn't point. He doesn't instruct. He's not going to say, you're going to exactly find it here and it's guaranteed to be found. I think Paul is saying, I'm going to tell you what to look for, but I'm not going to tell you how to attain that. Whatever is out there, and if it's out there, you need to focus on those things. Because the only way you're going to find it is if you look for it. The only way you're going to see it is if you're focused on it. So I think he's saying to them, I want you to focus not on your circumstances, not on the injustices you've suffered, not on the way people are treating you, not on the difficult people, not on the things that you don't have, not on your danger, not on your division, not on your distress. I want you to focus on the things of God. Whatever it is, focus on those things. Dwell on those things. And if you do this, then verse 9 the God of peace will be with you. He's making them accountable for themselves. It's up to you. He's saying to them, it's up to you whether to choose worry or choose worship. But choose wisely. And as we begin to look into this new year, and we really look at what we've done, I want to exhort you to learn to rejoice in any and all situations. I want you to choose worship over worry. Don't allow your external circumstances to rob you of your joy. Make sure that your joy is rooted in Christ and Christ alone. If your joy is based on anything else, it's not guaranteed. It's temporal. Oh, but I, uh, I've got it in this thing or in that. Maybe it's rooted in my job or in my, my bank account or maybe my, my relationship or in my marriage. It doesn't matter. If it's not in God, it's not permanent. It's not guaranteed. Work on the gentleness of your spirit. Let your gentleness be seen. Boost your prayer life. Be more committed and dwell on the things of God. Nick Sitzman became the victim of his own worry. Don't do the same. Follow this. He let worry and fear take his life. And it's time for you to stop worrying. It's time for you to know what to do with it. It's time for you to choose worship over worry. The perfect antidote to worry is worship. Amen? Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. If you'll please stand with me. Lord, Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. And I thank you for your message and the reminder, Lord Father, that in the midst of danger or division or distress, we're going to always find ourselves always with a choice. What to do in the midst of such struggles? And Lord, as we look to the new year, we first give you thanks for the year you've given us. I thank you, Lord, for how you've blessed this church. And I thank you now for its future because I know that this, the future of this church is in your hands. And so, Lord, I praise you and I thank you for the days ahead. And Lord, I know, I know that, that distress will come. I know that difficulties will arise. I know that dangers are ahead. But I also know that you're with us. I also know that you've given us a promise. I also know, Lord, that you've given us prayer and petition. I know that you've equipped us with your spirit. And I know that whatever the days are ahead, I won't fear. And I'm not worried. Not because, because of me or because I'm trusting in my own strength, but because I know who you are. Because I know what you can do and I know what you've done. So, Lord, on this day we remember. 
with thanksgiving, we remember all the things that you've done and all the things that you're going to do. So, Lord, we pray that this church is always a prayerful church. I pray that this church is always in remembrance of the things that you've done, that we don't fear, that we don't let worry take root in our lives. And, Lord, I pray over every family, every household here today, Lord, let our gentleness be seen. Let your spirit dwell in us. Lord, that we seek whatever is good out there. That we focus on the things that you want us to focus on and not on the things that the enemy wants to distract us with. Lord, let, let whatever worries that anybody is here is coming with and is holding, Lord, let them release it today and say, Lord, I've been worried about things that I have no control over. I've been distressed about things that are out of my hands. Lord, I pray that today they can learn to take the first step of being worry-free, not because we're blind to it, not because we don't care about it, but because we know, Lord, that we serve you and that if we trust in you, that we know that you will always guide us to truth and to safety and to provision. Lord, even if death should take us, Lord, we know that we know that nothing, nothing can prevail over you. And so, Lord, today we pray to take the first step and we pray that whatever worries we have, that today that they can, they can be put in the proper place. That they can be put in prayer and be given to you to be judged and condemned and cast away so that we can focus on the things that really matter. Lord, equip us to be these kinds of people each and every day as the new year comes. Thank you again, Lord Father, for your word. And I pray in all this through your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I hope you all have a blessed week. And we look forward to reconnecting with you again soon. Hope to see you here on Wednesday. If not, we'll see you next Sunday. God bless you. God bless you.